Okay, got okay. it. Who is this? Okay, so hello everyone. Again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, according to where you are. Uh, my name is Clara Saraiva. I'm a Portuguese anthropologist, and um, as you know, I'm part of the WCA board, uh, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, and I've been organizing this webinar since 2020, when the pandemic started. Um, these webinars are now WOW webinars, so World Anthropological Union, which is a, an institution that actually aggregates both WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, and IUAES, which is the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. So now WCA and IUAS organize this together, and I want to thank my colleague Sabata Shana for organizing this with me. Um, and as you all know, also, I've sent you in the several mails the site where you can find the videotapes of the previous re of the previous webinars that have been lasting for three years, basically. Um, this webinar is actually the second webinar on the topic of global editors. That's why it's called Global Editors 2, because we we had the first one about two months ago, and it was a, a success. So we decided to do one more, especially because uh, being an editor and uh, heading a journal in anthropology nowadays is a complicated issue. And of course, there's always the difference or the, the distance between the big journals and the small journals. And that's something that uh, we've always wanted to discuss further. Uh, so I want to thank, first of all, uh, my colleagues in uh, the WCA organizing committee, and especially Michelle Bouchard, who is the secretary and helps me in getting this uh, going. And also Luisa Giardini, who is a student in Brazil, who always does the posters. I apologize for some mistakes that were in the first poster. Uh, we had a few glitches there, but they're solved. And uh, I also want to thank, of course, the WCAA uh, Publishing Council, who, who is actually the sponsor of this uh, Global Editors webinars. Uh, it was the WCAA Publishing Council that came up with this idea, which was, of course, very welcomed by everyone. And that's why we're doing this. So I will... Um, very briefly introduce the speakers, really briefly, because I don't have CDs oh. from everyone, not everyone sent them, but it's okay. And uh, and then I will pass the word to Emily Metzner, who will uh, say a few words in the name of the WCA Publishing Council. And then I'll read some of the topics dash questions that we sent you, and then we'll go on with this. As I told you in the mails, this is a very informal session uh, where each person can present uh, his or her ideas for like around five minutes. And then we have a second round of also four or five minutes each, and then we'll open up to questions. Questions can be addressed either in the Zoom or through the chat. And we always ask the interveners to please present themselves either in the chat or, um, or when they speak so that we know which country they come from basically. That's the idea. So we have an idea also what the different associations are contributing to and how interested they are in the WOW um, initiatives. So today we will have, um, as I said, starting from East to West, we will have Sumahan Banerjee, who's the editor of Man in India, which is actually a, a, a journal continuously published since uh, since a long time, for 103 years, the oldest surviving journal of anthropology in the Indian subcontinent. So this is quite interesting. He's also a professor at the Vidya Zagar University in West Bengal, India. Then we'll have Stephanie Kitchen, who is the managing editor of the journal Africa, amongst other publications of the International African Institute based in London. We will also have Teresa Connor who is the chief editor of the Journal of Anthropology of Southern Africa in South Africa. I know it's being currently published in the UK, so I don't know if the basis is still in South Africa or not, but she will explain us that. Then we will have Humberto Martins, a colleague of mine and friend also, editor-in-chief of Ethnographica, which is a, a journal of the Center for Research in Anthropology, the major anthropological research center in Portugal. He's also a, uh, a professor at the Universidade Transmonte Outdoor, a university up in the northeast of Portugal. Then we will have Diana, or Diana Lenton, 
who is the director of Publicar, published by the Colegio de Graduados en Antropología in Argentina. She teaches at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and uh, she teach, she's also an independent researcher at the National Council on Science and Technologies. And then last but not least, we'll have Luis Costa, who is uh, the editor of HAL, Journal of Anthropological Theory, and he is a professor of cultural anthropology at the Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So this is our, our guests, our participants, and I thank them all very, very much for being here today and for having accepted to do this. It's always complicated to get many people together according to dates, calendars, et cetera, but we made it, so we're here. So I will now, um, please, uh, if Emily, yeah, Emily, I will pass the word to Emily so that she can uh, say a few words about the um, WCA Publishing Council. Emily, please. Thank you, Clara. Thank you for organizing and hosting and moderating today. Um, my name is Emily Metzner. I'm a sociocultural anthropologist based in the USA, and um, I'm a member of the WCAA's Publishing Council. Um, so the Publishing Council oversees WCAA publications and seeks to promote the circulation of anthropological work. In 2021, the group um, turned its attention to the makeup of editorial boards of anthropology journals around the globe, looking to find global diversity and significant representation of anthropologists producing knowledge from the global south. The patterns we observed raised questions for us about what kinds of challenges chief editors face in ensuring global diversity on their editorial boards and in their publications, um, and prompted us to hold a forum for these conversations to deepen and share knowledge and to reach wider publics, um, and in doing so to share and devise strategies and ideas for how to overcome uh, some of these obstacles. So the first of these fora was a WOW webinar on March 23rd of this year, as Clara mentioned. Uh, this is the second of these forums, and today's webinar featuring, featuring chief editors of anthropological journals in several parts of the world will map out global practices, problems, and hopes for anthropological publishing um, in several parts of the world, and will explore what associations such as WOW can do to enhance global diversity in anthropological journal publishing. So we hope to learn how best to support global diversity in editorships and thus in publishing and in the circulation of anthropological knowledge. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much, Emily. So following up on Emily's um, comments, uh, and since normally these webinars last one and a half hour, up to one hour, 45 minutes tops, um, I will just uh, now proceed to reading the questions, the themes that we sent to the participants. And as I said, you are not obliged to comment on any of this. You can, of course, go your own way. But this was just to give you a guideline on, on, on things that interest us, of course. So the first uh, issue was, what are your journal's goals, missions, and objectives? Is, our, is your editorial board diverse? What are your diversity goals for your editorial board? Is global diversity a specific aspiration? What are the ways you attempt to reach these goals? And what are the three main obstacles you face in building a globally diverse editorial board? The second set of questions was, uh, were, well, go around a, a basic question, which is what challenges do you face? What are the challenges you've encountered in sustaining globally diverse content? Other than board diversity, how do you ensure global diversity of your published materials, which of course has to do with language, et cetera, et cetera. And the third issue, management. How do you handle international manuscript reviewers and editorial boards? And of course, we know that one of the main questions that triggered this webinars was certainly the issue, which was already discussed in the other webinar, of course, of the English hegemony, right? The fact that as researchers, we all need to publish in English. And on the one hand, that's good. On the other hand, that's bad because people don't publish in their own languages or they try to publish in English because that gives them more points when they want to go up in their careers, obtain tenure, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll start. Um, I will give the word first to our colleague from uh, Man in India, Sumahan, please. And thank you very much once again. 
And please, I just ask you to respect the five minutes because we have six people today, which is a lot. Normally we have four to five. So please keep, keep in mind the timing, okay? Thank you very much, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Clara. Uh, good evening from India and greetings to my respected colleagues on behalf of Man in India. And also uh, in particular to uh, Professor Shubhada Mitrachana, all my regards to her as well. Now we are we are talking about uh, already mentioned the man in India. The journal was actually founded in 1921 by Sarat Chandrai, who is called the uh, the father of Indian anthropology or father of Indian ethnography. He was the founder, and uh, I have taken the editor chief in 2019. And before me, there are 14. Uh, uh, editors, and some of them are very illustrious anthropologists of uh, global repute, and uh, and also uh, also a good number of uh, a good number of contributions from India and abroad. Uh, in, in, in my presentation, that that means in my talk, I would like to in the first section, I would like to focus on the goal and objectives of uh, of my journal. Uh, and in the second half, I shall take up the other two issues, particularly with regard to management and what we can do and we can we expect uh, from the uh, global uh, uh, academia uh, to support uh, the journals like us. So to uh, talk about the objectives, uh, the journal was uh, basically the brainchild of uh, Sarat Chandrai. In the very first issue, uh, of the journal, he uh, uh, clearly stated its objectives in, in the, that that is to assist the anthropological study and research in India and to serve as a useful medium for the collection of interesting anthropological information regarding Indian man. That was the basic objective. Although focused on India, Yet he had the expectation that anthropological researches published in the journal would, quote, uh, from his uh, writing, uh, to prove a great gain to the Indian nation and to the scientific world at large. He hoped that uh, that a, a, a in an Indian school of anthropology will be developed uh, through uh, publications. Uh, uh, Genre. Uh, but uh, Roy also lamented that uh, the Indians were taking little interest in publishing ethnological things, and he also praised the European scholars for their leading role in this regard. Again, his initiative to bring out an anthropology journal was influenced by his nationalistic motivation. However, he wrote that the suggestions from Western scholars could be published from time to time. So uh, this was basically the idea. And, uh, and, and, and uh, as a result of that, he uh, continued to publish uh, uh, the journal and before the independence, particularly during his editorship of 21 years, we have the publications uh, from the uh, scholars of Indian origin. And also uh, almost half of the total contributors were scholars from uh, Western origin. But later, uh, uh, the situation uh, changed a lot. And uh, uh, to, with regard to the global editorship, uh, I must add that we have representation from UK, from Germany, uh, from Canada uh, in our, in our uh, editorial board. But as we are basically focused on anthropology in Indian context, our scope is limited in this regard. Therefore, we have not diversified much of our editorial board much. But in constituting the, the globally diverse editorial board, we consider whether the scholar has done any anthropological study in India or in some way exposed to the ethnographic studies done in India. Our second, but there are some obstacles in doing this. Uh, the first is to uh, uh, locate or identify the scholars. And second one is to procure the consent of the scholar. And again, to third, 
to get the scholars involved in the act because all all the in the process of review or get, getting advice from him because all are so much busy and all sometimes they uh, i have no complaint against anyone but it is a fact that uh, the review is a very it's a great challenge and uh, coming to some other challenges we must say that we have a, a problem of visibility uh, and some technical uh, uh, obstacles are there uh, because still uh, we don't have much uh, support uh, to do the do the work editorial work and most of the editorial works are done manually i have no editorial assistance i have to uh, uh, send the to do the correspondence send the paper for review everything is done by myself and second is uh, i we have no professional support uh, in the in the, in the uh, for the for the uh, indexing or 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 you know, generating info factor these are all professional kind of thing we are not that much professionally uh, equipped so this is an important problem and uh, uh, there is also a problem of getting good numbers of good papers uh, apart from getting reviewers as well we will do it meticulously on time so at the same time the government policy in india is also affecting the flow of papers uh, and also uh, the, the 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 kind of journal the standard of journal so but we are also fortunate that uh, in case of man in india it has a global reputation as the oldest anthropology journal or the surviving anthropology journal in india but uh, and also uh, uh, the, the, that that the journal uh, has a great role in the development of anthropology in india and if one uh, is to know the trajectory of development of anthropology in india, uh, man in india is a great resource but at the same time we must uh, admit that uh, that uh, that that our our problem uh, are, are many so i shall come back to these issues again uh, uh, in the second part of the section to elaborate it and to give some suggestion if possible uh, to to accommodate uh, from you thank you okay. very much yes thank we are much. we are thank being uh, zoom bombed uh, Michelle, can you do something about it? Can we cut that person? Yes, yes, I'm working on it now. So. <laughs> we are sharing a very interesting uh, screen. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so I, don't, yeah. I don't know how people do these talk. things like 10 years old do, but well, uh, you know. Thank you very much. Give, give some okay. spice into uh, global editors. <laughs> So who is the one I guess uh, boom bombing us? I I don't know. We don't know who's bombing us. It's just it's Subhadra. Uh, okay. It's Subhadra. No, I don't think so. No, <laughs> I know, I know. Subhadra. We're joking. We're joking. Relax. We're joking. Okay. So we'll move on to Stephanie Kitchen. Can you see us? Yes. Hello. Hello, uh, thanks very much for inviting me and it's an honour to go after Man in India set up in 1921. So I'm speaking for the journal Africa um, run for London, established in 1928 with the goal of publishing ethnographic research on or from the African continent, which I think has been largely consistent through, through the decades. Um, the journal is currently published under contract with Cambridge University Press. It's increasingly open access and will be fully open access within five years. It publishes five issues a year, around a thousand pages, publishes reviews, review articles, special issues, occasional lectures. We publish abstracts in three languages, English, French and Portuguese, and we sometimes translate papers from those languages, from Portuguese and French into English, and we'll, and we'll publish two, two language versions. So we do review submissions in languages other than English, although we then tend to go for translated options for, for final publication into English. Um, I tried to answer the questions around the editorial board um, focus for today. So, I mean, largely our editorial board is from three continents, from Europe, Africa and North America. Um, I think, you know, to be sort of completely honest as well with, with this sort of session, it's 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 fairly male dominated. Um, should I just carry on? Yes. Um, okay. It's somewhat Eurocentric, I think, given the history of the journal as a European African Studies journal. Um, but but that said, we have broad membership from from three continents, and we do regularly review 
um, and update the board. The kind of key criteria to be on the board is you have to be a regular reviewer for the journal. You don't necessarily need to be published in the journal, but you do need to be turning around like regular reports. So it's very much a reviewing board. Um, I also looked at the locations of published authors vis-a-vis -vis the kind of make the board to um, answer this question. And broadly, about around 30% of our papers are from authors based in the African continent, 30% from the USA or North America, and 40% from, from Europe. So I think we're, we're quite happy with that, that sort of overview, although I don't think those, those numbers are quite reflective on the board. Um, in terms of obstacles faced, um, I think the key sort of obstacle that underlines the challenges of the journal, which is, is well resourced and doesn't necessarily have the kinds of issues that Man in India was talking about. We, we don't struggle with you know, the professionalization aspects that, that they were talking about, you know, such as citation indexes and so on, where, where we do, you know, in a sense, struggle, which is inherent in, in the project of the journal to do our uh, in areas to do with the kind of weaknesses of the disciplines in the countries, by which we largely mean lack of funding for research in anthropology, sociology, social, social history research, and other similar disciplines. Also, the costs of attending conferences, events, meetings, and so on for colleagues from these regions. So, our institute funds what it can to bring people to editorial board meetings and conferences, and obviously, hybrid events give them participation options, but connectivity is an issue and we don't want to develop a two-tier system whereby colleagues from the South struggle to participate online, whereas those from well-funded institutions have the benefit of investment independence. And then other challenges under, sort of, under the label of diversity. Um, so we want to publish leading authors simultaneously from Europe, and we do, Africa, and we do sometimes, so we probably miss a few in, in the USA. Um, we're making more efforts in that direction, actually, where we clearly compete with the major and excellent US-based disciplinary anthropology journals, American ethnologists, and so on. Um, we do our best to get such colleagues who work on Africa to publish in our journal as well. Um, on the 30% of authors from the continent, from the African continent publishing in Africa, the overwhelming majority, 90% or even sometimes all, are male. Um, a pattern we see year after year. There are many African scholars based in and publishing from the US, but again, this is, is very male dominated. So the participation of African women in anthropology remains a major challenge, despite some leading luminaries, people like Alcinda Honwana, the older generation and the younger upcoming generation we hope to nurture. So the one from Gui Kimari is on our board um, from Kenya at the moment. And then on the management question, how do we handle international manuscripts reviews and editorial boards? So all our systems are electronic. So in that sense, the location of authors or editorial board members is inconsequent. Um, editorial board meetings have been online or hybrid in recent times. Reviewers are frequently used from other continents. So in that sense, the journal is entirely online and international, but, but the challenges I spoke about earlier um, do remain. I was going to stop there for my first segment to pass on to someone else. Sorry, my sound, I was muted. Um, thank you very much. We'll now have Teresa Connor from Journal of Anthropology, Southern Africa. Are you there, Teresa? Yes. Uh, could Hi. everyone who's not speaking now please mute yourselves so that we don't get back noises? Helen, yes, thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm from uh, Anthropology Southern Africa, which is um, the peer of review journal associated with uh, the association Anthropology Southern Africa. We were established uh, as the South African Journal of Ethnology in 1978. So we officially changed our focus and uh, became associated with Tan and Francis um, from about 2002. So generally we uh, aim, aim to promote anthropology in Southern Africa, although we do publish uh, papers from other countries in Africa, or we uh, can publish papers associated with Southern Africa. So usually our papers, we've got four issues a year, um about six papers per issue and uh we have about 30 to 50 percent uh authorship 
based in Southern Africa. Oh my and... god! Oh my god! Oh, here we go. Yeah. Oh dear. Okay, I'll carry on. What happens? <laughs> okay, so um, we are currently we have uh, two editors, um, and uh, we have a book review editor. Uh, we used to have three editors, but we're currently looking for another editor because I'm going to leave uh, soon. So uh, we're currently looking for another two editors, and we have a system whereby we uh, have junior editors coming in, and then they slowly move up and become editor and then chief editor, which is quite good. Um, and then we also have book review editor, which only handles book reviews. And then we also have an editorial assistant who is actually – the main person because she deals with you know all the things that we don't really want to do with so her and she um she is a it's a, this is a paid position usually so um but at the moment we have some issues that i'll go into later but anyway so our readership let me just go through okay we um also have a editorial board which we renew every three to every four years and they, they serve a, a term of two years so we in 2022 we had undertook a review so we appointed six new members and we replaced 14 of our members and our editorial board is generally uh, from South Africa like 14 of them, uh, I think that's about 50%, and about, uh, uh, I should say, no, so, sorry, about 70% from Southern Africa, and about six, uh, about sort of 30% from Europe and uh, the US. So our main readership lies within Africa, and uh, our downloads may, mainly from, from Europe as well, sort of half-half. Um, with a few US uh, downloads. So um, we, are, we have, obviously we have issues, we have financial issues because we have to pay our editorial assistant who do, does most of the, the uh, work for us, which is currently we're unable to pay her. So we have a kind of situation with that at the moment. Um, and we do usually get support from the organization through conferences and so on. So, but the conference, the conferencing in the last three years, I think due to COVID, because no one wants to attend physically anymore. So conference fees have just declined. And so the association itself has financial problems. And so the journal has financial problems. So um, TNF do not provide funding for our editorial assistant. They used to in the past at like a partial fee, but uh, we should, you know, the association usually funds the editorial assistant. Um, so I don't know how widespread that is within other journals because we're trying to, we, part of my mission is to try and find out how tenable that situation is and how other journals manage uh, to 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 find funding for things like editorial assistance then we also have um, uh, we have two annual prizes usually awarded to younger scholars so we have like a graduate student who would write a really good essay they would win um, a prize and then we also have a Monica Wilson prize uh, also, which is for master students, and then they would be able to publish in the journal through that. We would, and we have a good, we have a good policy with younger scholars. We will take, you know, the the chief editor will take them through the editorial process before the paper is reviewed, get the paper up to spec, and then the paper is reviewed as normal. So I think that's pretty much uh, much it. So think we had some issues uh yeah thank you thank you very much teresa let's thank hope we get thank any you. more interruptions uh, thank you uh, we will now move on to umberto martins from ethnographic elizabeth hi hello everybody 
also my hello to the old hackers that probably are here listening to us. Good <laughs> evening, good afternoon. Be welcome and try to learn with us a bit and try to enjoy anthropology. And, uh, um, and moving, because we have uh, not much time to, to, to speak in this first round, and uh, basically I'm, I'm, Ethnographic was created in, created in 1997, 1997. Uh, we, we celebrated 25 years last year, and basically to prepare for this question about diversity that was proposed to us, I, I, I went through the, the founded the founding text of the journal back in 1977 and uh, Jean Lial, the, the first director of the of the magazine wrote this that I will quote now the journal's task is to provide an open and plural space for publication dissemination and debate in anthropology a space for the formation of anthropology well probably that was the and this this is the main goal of this journal in, well, well, Jesus Christ. We still here. Are you getting anything, Umberto? What are you getting? We're not getting anything, Umberto. We're not getting anything. No, it's him. He disappeared. <laughs> this has been a really troubled webinar. It's fun. Uh... Wait, wait, wait. He said this could happen and he'll be right back. But the, the thing I think is what I don't happened? see Diana. We lost two. We you lost Diana. Have. Diana did not come back, neither did Luis or Leah. Where are they? I sent them a, an email saying that they could get back on the same on the same link. This is... Well, maybe maybe he lost uh, maybe he lost his, his signal or his internet connection was unstable. Something like that, because he told me before that it could happen. Uh, I was just worried because uh, because of the bombers. I just thought that it was something connected with yeah. it. Might not be. So now let's see. Diana, Diana is not here. She was here before, but she didn't come back after the Zooming. Neither did Leah or Luis Costa. Luis? No, Luis was not in the way you were, so. Sorry? Uh, Christina. Did, did you like let it? Luis back in, Michelle? I'm just keeping an eye on the waiting room. So anybody who shows up and looks legitimate and putting putting that back in. Somebody know Agostina Gaglio. Did did you see that just a while ago? Somebody entered with Subatra instead oh, of Subatra. Did you yeah. see yeah. it? No, 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 no. Subatra it wasn't it was a, Subatra. It was a don't, fake let, one. don't let that person in. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a fake Subatra. He was even misspelled. It wasn't even Subadra. It was Sub something. Subatra but... with a T. It was misspelled. And, and it was a, a Do you know uh, Francesca? Francesca, where is Francesca? Francesca's there. Francesca Dettli. Yeah, that's her. Yes, yes. yes. yeah. We know yeah. 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 Subadra, Subadra is in the movie. And who is Huzefi? I don't know. Who is Huzefi? Oh, well, I did ask. He's a student. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Isaac, we know Isaac. Oh, there's Diana. Okay, Diana's back. Diana? Can you show yourself? Who, me? No, no. Diana. Oh, but we're oh, having okay. to you, Isaac. <laughs> All right. Diana? 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 I don't know. Diana? Diana? Are you there, Diana? I can see her. I can see the I right. See is this, I don't know. Somehow this today sounds looks to me like a spiritual session. Where is, are you there? Are you there? You know, and we, we summon, we summon the spirit. And not only Diana that, who is, there, right? is there? Who is there? Oh, wait, wait, so Diana is here now. We are summoning the spirits. Okay. So, oh, wait. Diana, so sit somewhere. Diana, mira, estás me oyendo? Sí. Yes. Uh, so since our colleague from Portugal disappeared, uh, can you please go on since you were the, the next one and he'll eventually come back, I hope. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so Diana from Publicar, Colegio de Graduadas, Argentina. Yes. Yeah. But you have to speak English because thank you. Only some of us, yeah. only some of us uh, uh, know Spanish, so sorry. 
No, but right. I just said the name of the university. Otherwise, I've been talking in Portuguese. In English. You're right. You're right. Okay, Diana. Right. Okay. Go ahead. You have the floor. Publicar en Antropología y Ciencias Sociales, the journal I am introducing is the Argentinian Association of Anthropology Graduates Journal. Originally, it proposed to publicize the variety of work of anthropologists throughout the country. And recently, it was opened to collaborations from all over Latin America, in Spanish and Portuguese. We receive articles on classic topics in anthropology, but we, we are also interested in showing controversial topics or those that are related to problems of social interest. On the one hand, we seek to make the production of the, bill of the, of the field visible with a broad definition of such academic and extra academic field. We publish research articles, book reviews, thesis summaries, and interviews. At the same time, we seek to establish positions on certain issues or problems. For example, we have published a dossier on the academic approach to gender violence, another dossier on anthropological work in the management of public policies, another one on the challenges of working in judicial affairs, and so on. Now, for the 30th anniversary of our journal, we are about to publish a dossier that reflects and may contribute to the discussion of the new or not so new challenges of publishing in social sciences in relation to the consolidation of an academic field or certain theories or of certain scientific communities and also in relation to professional paths and political positions. Publicar has the specific feature of being the journal of an, an, a professional association. And it seeks a balance between the provisions of our association founded in 1973 and the changes that the profession is undergoing. It has a direct impact, first of all, on the definition of who can be authors. Since the very definition of, of anthropologists has changed and today, Postgraduate degrees have taken a central place compared to the traditional degree. As a journal, we receive articles from postgraduates in anthropology coming from other graduate disciplines, although according to the statute of our association, we give priority to graduates. We are a journal with a national scope, which accepts articles from the region, as long as they are relevant from a local perspective in other words, we do not seek to become international without reflexivity. On the contrary, basing on the discussions we want to give, we convene colleagues from the region to write in the main languages of Latin America, Portuguese and Spanish. Our editorial bo board is made up of male and female anthropologists from Argentina with diverse work experience and academic belonging to different institutions in Argentina and Brazil. An important point is that nowadays we welcome also articles when they are written in non-sexist language. This is fundamental now since it is unlikely that the discussion environment attentive to diversity can be built from a sexist language. So we started posting in non-sexist language with the expectation that this position will increase. And Thank you very much, it. Diana. And Thank so you. now we'll move on to Luis Costa. Luis, are you there? Uh, yes, sorry. Okay. Apologies. Okay. Uh, sorry. Luis Costa from um, uh, the Journal of uh, Ethnological Theory. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for the invitation. So let me just organize myself here. Uh, yeah, I'm one of the actually one of the uh, co-editors of the of how the Journal of Ethnographic Theory. We're actually five at the moment. Uh, when I started, we were three, and uh, I think that the, the editor well, we call it the the editorial collective, which is actually quite diversified as well, it includes people from from all over the world. Uh, there's myself uh, based in in Brazil in Rio de Janeiro. 
And then we have uh, uh, Adeline Mascalio at, at Tulane, University of Tulane in the US. And we have Louisa Lombard at Yale. We have Andrew Kipnis at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Raminder Kaur at the University of Sussex. The sort of varied uh, editorial collective is, is uh, quite intentional. And it's something that we, we even when we substitute editors, we try to 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 find people from the same regions or from or or from other regions that we might be interested in having uh, uh, ed editors participate. It does make editorial collective meetings a bit difficult because of the time zones, but it's uh, um, it, it it works out fine. And I think we also think it's uh, in terms of our experience, and I think I speak for all of my colleagues at the editorial collective. It's very. Um, uh, how does it? It's very, it's very productive. It yields quite a lot. We all have very different views of what anthropology is in different national traditions, and it's something we all bring to the to our discussions and to the journal. and And I'd like to think that it's something that we, um, yeah, that that we we, I mean, we we gain a lot from. Uh, I hope. Um, the editorial, uh, uh, the scientific editorial board is actually quite varied as well, and it reflects this. Um, uh, the, this politics of 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 you know bringing people from all over the world, and we have you know colleagues from 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 other places such as India and from South Africa and 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 so forth. Um, in terms of the submissions we have, we we um, uh, we, we have um, uh, uh, well we we accept articles, and this is a policy that we sort of inherited when I joined the journal back in two thousand and nineteen. We have um, uh, we we accept articles in Portuguese, in Spanish, and in French, and they are reviewed in Portuguese, Spanish, and in French. And only if they're accepted are they then translated. Or then we ask the author to to translate it, uh, which which as, uh, saves a lot, of course, in translating costs <clears throat> for articles that may eventually not be accepted. Uh, that is a bit of a challenge, actually, in in uh, the sense that we get. It's, it's sometimes hard to get reviewers in these languages. I mean, it's hard to get reviewers anyway, and, and particularly in these languages, I think uh, there tends to be a smaller pool of reviewers, uh, which is which is a further problem. Um, but it's it, it's it's worked out well. We've recently published uh, a colleague from Argentina who who worked in that uh, who who did that. We also do have a, a bit of a problem with the translation. We don't have any uh, registered translators in in. In, in the journal, we, although we do have people we suggest, but sometimes the quality of the translation isn't great. So that needs to go through a further round and and uh, and so forth. And um, um, I'm sorry, did I miss anything of the, the main points? I'm sorry if I've... Uh, the, the, the journal's aim has always been to put ethnography at the forefront of... of um, of the articles we publish, and we have a lot of special sections that that uh, address this directly. I mean, we have regular research articles, but we also have a, a number of features, well, special sections, but also um, um, a book symposia, fora, and, and around certain themes, and book symposia will have up to six reviews and generally a reply from the author. Um, we have we also publish translations of classic uh, uh, anthropological works from from all different languages. Um, we uh, we also have a new section called currents, which aims to um, uh, the idea is to publish sort of uh, uh, things that are in the news at the moment, uh, published by anthropologists who have long term experience of working in the places where these news events blow up. So we've had we've had a uh, one on on um, on fascism in Brazil, we've had one on on uh, Russia recently, the role of Russia in the world, uh, one on uh, the Uyghur uh, situation in China, and and so forth. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all I I'd, I'd have to say. Thank you, Luis. I think everybody's back in. Umberto is back in also. So Umberto, do you mind taking where you were or? We're starting again since you had just started. Yeah, sorry about this. I was explaining before to Clara that somehow my Zoom after 30 minutes, it crashes every time. I'm sorry. Um, I was saying that basically we, uh, in Ethnographic, uh, that was founded in 1997, uh, we celebrated 25 years last year. We, um, it's a, it's a, 
a journal that celebrates anthropology in Portugal, in a country that actually is not very easy to um, to affirm it to 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 clear uh, defend anthropology and um, um, responding to the to concrete questions that were placed to us in this for this seminar about the global diversity about diversity <clears throat> I would say that ethnographic um, is a is a journal that that um, seeks for that diversity in different ways um, first of all with the editorial boards actually we are now 12 we, this this editorial board um, uh, is in sh on charge since uh, July 2021 and we are 12 and we can say that we are diverse in the sense of age uh, sex uh, nationalities uh, the majority of us are Portuguese but also we have uh, colleagues from France from Brazil from from uh, Spain from Chile um, and not only in terms of na their nationalities, but also in terms of their, where they are based. Some are, even some colleagues of Portugal are based in different uh, geographies, let's say. And that is an, one way that we try to, to achieve that diversity that is asked for in this, for, well, well. I think he disappeared again. I'll just yeah. I'll just say a few more things about ethnographic since I know what's going on. It's a peer-reviewed journal. It's classified on Scopus, etc., and it publishes in four languages: Portuguese, English, French, and Spanish. And uh, we'll just go to the second round and see if Umberto comes back in because I think he's having a lot of problems with Zoom because now he said it would be over after half an hour, but he wasn't even five minutes in, and it just collapsed. So we'll go to the second round and please feel free to just, you know, to discuss things beyond the questions we asked. Uh, if you want to, to, to pose any other, uh, you know, discuss other issues, go ahead. So we'll go again to Sumahan Banerjee, but I don't see him anymore. Yeah, this thing with the Zoom today was not, oh, here it is. Here he is. Uh, he is, he was here. Now he disappeared. There he is. Could you? Go ahead, please, Sumahan. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, could you hear me? And yes, we can I'm hear. Visible? You. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, actually, uh, what I was uh, 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 talking about uh, the the uh, this, uh, the way we can uh, overcome the obstacles that we are facing, uh, that uh, that we can uh, assist, help each other to develop a more connected network among the editors and uh, by 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 through a, uh, through a whatsapp group or the kind of platform in which we can exchange our views and ideas also uh, shares the, the the soft copies of journals or the contents with con con consent from the from the editors and also uh, to to assist uh, to ensure greater visibility uh, indexing or impact and uh, the, the the webinars may be arranged in this way uh, to have more interactions uh, among the editors and also to assist in suggesting reviewers and also advise how the journal located in a particular part of the world uh, can develop or contribute a, on its own way uh, to, to fill the critical gap or a particular gap that can be addressed by that uh, that journal locally uh, posited. So this can be some of the measures. And in WhatsApp group, I think, be a, a good idea if it is. And at the same time, we can also exchange or contribute some uh, some some write-ups on the journals and the kind of problems the journals are facing. At the same time, the kind of orientations the journal have, the kind of uh, anthropological works uh, which are being done in the, the respective countries and also the, the, the development of anthropology in those regions because there are 
number of journal divers uh, representing divers uh, uh, ethnic and cultural uh, uh, backgrounds so i think these kinds of uh, uh, approaches will ensure uh, a greater visibility greater networking and also uh, uh, good connectivity as well as some professional support a, a particular webinar can be arranged so that we can uh, have some uh, greater input uh, to, to increase our professional expertise so this way we can help each other i think this is important and uh, also uh, so this this much uh, i have to say at present but one and one interesting point that i i missed uh, first time just one two lines one we are we are talking about the physical infrastructure uh, and the professional uh, structure etc but there is a great uh, concern uh, for the uh, publication in social sciences in, the, in 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 different countries because of the uh, emerging socio political situations because you are publishing something which may not be may not be uh, acceptable to the to the dominant group or some uh, group in power and so so doing research and publishing in journals this is i think a challenge great challenge for the uh, for at, at present and also uh, in days to come i think and this is a more ideological kind of question or theoretical kind of question thank you, thank you very much sumahan so we'll now uh, move on to stephanie is she there yes please stephanie I um, yeah, I just to say I very much agree with the last point about difficulty of social science publishing in other countries. I mean, perhaps not so much in the UK, although we have our issues. But our authors from Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Angola are, are not working in easy environments. So just to reiterate that, and I know authors from India working on African topics are also struggling at the moment. And I'm like, quite shocked to hear um, some of the things they were telling me about not feeling free to even present the research in, in India. I think this is an issue we all need to be alert to. I was going to say a couple of things on language. That's a core concern of this, this group, particularly, I think, with European languages, French, Portuguese. So Africa has had a long-standing focus on African languages and there are other journals that do linguistic research, so perhaps not that, including one we own, um, not that, but we do encourage a lot of citation from African languages, field research, and it's expected usually that authors publishing in the journal have knowledge of relevant African languages um, where they're doing their research. On, on the question of translation, and I mean, a few interesting points, I think, my experiences so we, we we do offer to cover costs um translation costs in french or portuguese and we're happy to review papers in those original languages we have people on the board who can do that 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 isn't the problem um we are in principle agree to review in Swahili and yoruba as well although we don't actually get that many credible submissions in languages other than english i think that's been the experience of this policy so we, we we get quite a lot of French papers, but they tend to be outside the scope of the journal, so they tend not to be coming from anthropological disciplines. Typically, we get agricultural papers from from North Africa, and we just reject them. Um, so, you know, that, I think that is a kind of an additional consideration. I think that clearly there are serious French and Portuguese journals and publishing industries that authors will go to first, and, and that's very understandable. And equally, top scholars, Lucifer and Francophone scholars, will actually submit to Africa in English because they are targeting a global audience. So um, I think from the point of view of kind of management and costs and so on, it's not really something to be afraid of in terms of opening up to other languages. But I think there are more structural things in play about actually genuinely working across those, those language barriers. Yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Teresa, are you there? Is a Connor? Uh, I don't see her. Oh, yeah, there she is. Hello. You're muted. You don't have any sound. Hey, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We also have uh, language issues, but we, because we were such a strongly South African journal, 
um, we when we when we transformed in um, two thousand and two, we tried to include more Portuguese uh, writers, but um, they're writing in English. For example, we have a special issue on Mozambique at the moment, which is quite interesting. But the papers are all written in English, but we do provide abstracts in Portuguese. Um, so that's uh, something we had to overcome because we are really surrounded by Portuguese uh, speakers. And um, so that's something for us. And recently we also were talking uh, in the editorial collective about um, artificial intelligence and what uh, this perhaps could have some impact on the on journals, especially our journal, because a lot of uh, students are using um, chat uh, to, to, to write with and to produce uh, summaries of documents and so on. So we, we were just thinking about what impact this would have on the journal because uh, how do you know if a person has printed a paper based on the chatbot or an abstract created by a chatbot? So, uh, especially for younger authors, we think this is quite an important issue to to look out for and to screen, you know, to screen papers to make sure that they haven't been generated by by art artificial intelligence. Um, we also thirdly, I mean, we had some ethical issues uh, come up in the last two years, and we had to remove a member from the editorial board, um, a prominent Southern African scholar. Um, who's a U.S. professor. So we had to remove him from, from the board and we had to uh, can actually cancel a, a book a book workshop, a book review workshop um, and, uh, you know, a workshop with um, other anthropologists because he was on the um, committee, he was on the screening board. So it was quite a big decision for us because um, he was a respected member and we had to, you know, take him off. So those are kind of the issues maybe we could talk about, um, hopefully. Thanks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, but now we can. I, I could not hear uh, something went wrong. This Zoom today is really a lot of trouble. Anyway, so thank you, Teresa. We'll move on to Umberto again. Let's, okay, it's the third time. This time it has to work, Umberto. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, everybody, and sorry, all the presents. And Speak fast. No more, no, more, no more jokes about hackers. Well, I respect <laughs> you much, very much. I'm a really good person. It's really God's good. punishment. It's God's punishment. It's the hackers' yeah. God's punishment. Well, I was saying that basically we try to <clears throat> to achieve that diversity as in, in ethnographic in different ways because, as I said, I, we have a, an editorial board uh, with people that are, we are, who are not only from Portugal but also from they are located in different parts of the world, and also um, the journal we published we admit publications and papers in four different languages: Portuguese, Spanish. Um, or Castilian, as as you want, English and French, and do, we do actually um, have a lot lots of papers and articles in those different languages. Obviously, the Portuguese is hegemonic, um, but uh, in the recent years, we are now having, um, let's say, a good percentage of papers in in Spanish, uh, mainly from countries as such as Chile, Argentina. And also that is due because in our editorial board, we have people who are based on those countries. And that is actually a kind of a, an, an, a what I would call a diplomatic a diplomacy, editorial diplomacy that we ask for those, those colleagues to do when they are in their own countries, try to engage with students, with the researchers, in try to invite them to write in ethnographica. And uh, also, I can say that um, Brazil, um, in this, as concerns this diversity, Brazil and Brazilian, let's say, if if you if you admit that uh, uh, Brazil is, 
is, uh, in, despite being a, um, a Portuguese-speaking country, let's say let's consider Brazil as a as a Frozen again. Following. Yes. Me. You you froze. Umberto, take out the image. Just leave the voice because you're freezing from time to time. And it's pretty hot here in Lisbon. So can you hear us, Umberto? Hello? Oh. No, we can't. Go on. No. Disappeared again. Okay, we'll move on to Diana again. Publicar. Yes. Okay. Uh, we receive also, we receive contributions in Spanish and Portuguese. As we have close ties with the Brazilian Academy, language is not a problem. Most Argentines understand written Portuguese and likewise, most Brazilians understand Spanish. Regarding articles from the rest of Latin America, all regional idioms are absolutely respected. Each article is preceded by a summary in Portuguese, Spanish, and English to facilitate its dissemination. But we do not receive or seek articles in English or other languages from the global north because we seek to make local productions in Latin American languages visible in a context in which the dissemination of academic productions outside of the English language is seriously underrepresented and threatened. Each article so is evaluated by a double blind system by specialists in the same language as the authors. Nowadays, a technical challenge arises from the publication of articles in non-sexist language. In the case of Spanish, this language in its written version uses unusual signs, for example, the X, the E, or the at sign, we say arroba in Spanish, the at sign, to avoid the declination that indicates feminine or masculine in Spanish or Portuguese. This fact challenges us to find consensual forms of expression that may also be read by automatic readers for people with poor hearing, for example, that is by systems that are also attentive to that diversity. All these issues we have been working and discussing. And last, I want to talk about uh, some different question about challenges regarding the challenges we face as a um, South American journal. Uh, we know that in order to survive, most journals decide to submit to the demands of global market. This is indexing, bureaucracies, professionalization, and so on. We see then that this market is separated between journals with and without resources to achieve those goals. Therefore, the main challenge being a journal with very limited resources as ours is survival itself. Every volume that we manage to issue is an achievement. It is a way of resisting the increasing demands to bureaucratize our journals and flatten their creative possibilities. To survive, moreover, means to be competitive. That is to be a real choice for a colleague to send us a contribution. Once again, there we have to challenge a non-written rule of the local publishing market that proposes that better abroad and better in English. Our colleagues publish for free in our journal, though through open journal system. In this way, we guarantee that all situations can find a place instead of only institutional positions being represented. The journal is financed by the association since it is a free access one. Funding is used then to pay the expenses of the proofreader and the layout artist who are the only people who get paid for their work. The entire editorial board is at honorem, of course. In this way, we managed to reduce the impact of economic concerns. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Luis, are you there? Yes, yes, he's there. 
Yes, yes, I'm here. Sorry? It's your turn. Second right, now. no, then I, I'm actually going to reply to a comment by um, uh, uh, Gordon. Gordon. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which I think is a very interesting and important comment. And uh, yeah. as far as how goes, I mean, uh, we, we have a, uh, how is a very curated journal? We have these special sections, uh, which uh, I, I mean, we have actually, uh, I have this up here now. We have a, a number of different sections, which includes, I'm not going to describe what all of them imply, but that there's the currents and the debates, and we have special lectures, and we have a colloquia and fora and book symposium, and we have these. Uh, final sections on which include unedited scholarship translations and occasionally reprints, and these are things that we, the editors and and the scientific editorial board, seek out and we ask people to to submit, and we also accept um, we consider, of course, a number of proposals for special sections, which uh, the the editorial collective may decide to accept uh, the submission or, or not, and if we do accept it, of course, it, 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 there needs to be I think at least four articles for it to be for it to qualify as a special section, anything less than that. And the articles either get published as research articles or or they don't get published at all. And I say this because actually the, the amount of submit, the only thing that's really submitted sort of spontaneously to how are the research articles, which uh, I think uh, uh, um, probably number more around 200 to 300 a year than the 600, the figure of 600, which, uh, which you put up. So, um, uh, which I guess is a lot more, of course, than than I know than many journals here in in Brazil for sure. Uh, uh, but yeah, just to address that, it is a journal that sort of when we we put the issue together, we really think of what we want to include and what we don't, and which sections have featured recently and which ones haven't. Uh, of course, we also want to feature, and this is something we consider for special sections as well, is is representative is, is how representative it is in terms of global anthropology. Uh, we also aim to feature a lot of uh, early career scholars when possible, for example, in book symposia, uh, where we have six reviews, uh, we always will have one early career and, and uh, you know, scholar from from what my my colleagues in, in, in Europe and the US call the global south, which I guess includes all of us <laughs> in different in different ways. And um, uh, so, yeah, we, I guess I guess we get we get a little bit less than that. And I think what what this means in terms of how is that it's a journal that's very um uh, it, we rely a lot on the scientific editorial board not only to do reviews, uh, but also to 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 seek out special sections and to look for things which are interesting for the journal and to uh, encourage people to to submit. Uh, they also look out for maybe lecture series that aren't published regularly, which we can publish more or less as as a, a transcript, and that won't go through peer review. Normally, it will just be reviewed by, by us and uh, an editorial board. So it's a uh, I guess one of the difficulties and just one of the personal challenges and how is just how varied and, and the different uh, uh, sections and their demands are and what that actually implies in terms of, of us having to adapt to these different registers um, for, for each issue. That's that. Thank you so much, Louise. Actually, I think the, the question that Gordon uh, wrote on the chat is very relevant because it's exactly the the reason why both in the other uh, global editors webinar and in this one, we tried to, you know, to have participants from smaller journals, uh, from smaller countries also like Ethnographica, which has, has not been able to say much, uh, and big journals like how, of course. So th there is, of course, as Gordon says, a huge discrepancy between the number of submissions and the publications you have and what a smaller uh journal has as for instance our colleague that was there just a while ago I don't know if she left from uh yeah uh, Linda I think she was uh Lisa Lisa practicing anthropology so smaller journals that have less submissions less publications etc so I think that would be something interesting to open up to the wider public now so if somebody else wants to participate as long as you're not a Zoom bomber uh we will now welcome questions from everyone and let's just open the debate Yes, Subatra, please. Yeah. You yeah. So I was thinking in terms of this unequal submission of articles. Uh, I don't know if it is possible, uh, but, uh, you know, like uh, journals that get a very large surplus of articles could then post them somewhere or you can have a pool or you could suggest 
uh, have a board of editors who are, you know, some uh, experts who could then give suggestions that where these articles can possibly be sent. I, I mean, it sounds a little uh, optimistic, but uh, do you think there is a possibility there? I think there's not, it's not only optimistic, it's perhaps a bit patronizing sometimes because the fact is the problem, Subhadra also, as I'm sure others will talk about now, is that people do want to publish in the major journals because it's good yeah, for their CV, right? Course. So that's the problem. So Virginia? No, I'm talking about the ones that cannot possibly be published. Of course, right, they will right. be sending and there would be some then that do get rejected, that don't, everything doesn't get published. I'm talking of those. Of course, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's it's complicated. Okay, Virginia? Okay, I, I have three questions uh, for this group in general. One is citations. One of the things I have discovered over the years is that uh, uh, when reviewers, certainly in American and U.S. journals, when um, reviewers for manuscripts in U.S. journals um, complain that some manuscript does not, isn't good enough. It's usually because they want um, things they have read or things that they know about. And they're usually in English, usually in the US or UK or Australia. Um, or they publish, they may include uh, some bibliographical material from, from uh, anthropologists in other places. But but not quite as as theory, just as sort of details. Uh, and so I wondered. I, mean, I know that uh, that there are at least now some editors of U.S. journals that are making a point of of sending a message to reviewers, asking them not to be too ethnocentric in in their work. So the, the one question is about citations. The second question is actually about anthropology itself. Are most of these journals basically, I don't know, um, social cultural anthropologists uh, in the US, uh, we tend, we still to talk about uh, four fields, including by We've lost Virginia. We lost Virginia again. Yes. This yes. is a Can crazy webinar. I've never people. seen so many problems. I know. And Virginia <laughs> is on every webinar. I've never lost her. I mean, she's. Uh, Virginia is always there. We never are pretty good. Yeah, I know. We lost her. Uh, Virginia, you've frozen as well. I've never ever seen a webinar this way. So it's <laughs> crazy. Anyway, but what we were discussing now, uh, starting with uh, Subhatra's question, was the fact that, well, we started off with uh, Gordon's comment on some journals having many submissions and many papers published, and other smaller journals having less, much less. Okay. Then Subhatra. Um, suggested that one way to solve this, or at least partially solve this, would be to resend that some of the bigger journals resend their authors, their uh, proposed papers to other journals, right? So we were discussing that now, and Virginia had started talking about the problem of quotation, and she was going moving on to the second item, and then we lost her. So it, I think the Going back to what I was saying before, the reason we, we tried this to have in the webinars larger journals and smaller journals is because that smaller journals have different problems from bigger ones, right? Big ones have absolutely no problem with submissions. Everybody wants to submit. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, for instance, Stephanie and, um, and Linda and um, Teresa also, because I didn't quite get it right. Like when you get papers in other languages, do you translate them or you publish them in the original languages? Because I think that's a move that uh, it is happening uh, lately in the past 10 years. It didn't used to be like that. 
most people, if the journals were in English, they would want everything to be translated in English, which was, of course, was a drawback for people who could not speak or write perfectly well in English. And that was that's one of the reasons we talk about hegemony in, in publication, right? The fact that everything had to be in English. But OK, I think Virginia is coming am, back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry we that. were saying that, look, we were saying that in this Zoom, everything is in this webinar, everything is going wrong. You never froze before in three years. It's the first time I've seen I've freeze. never, ever no. seen her going off. <laughs> OK, well, all right. Anyway, um, you get up where you were, Virginia. Okay, let's see. The second thing was about anthropology itself. Did you hear this? In the U.S., we still talk about the four fields as if, uh, I don't know, this were early 20th century. Uh, biological anthropology, linguistic anthropology, archaeological anthropology, sociocultural anthropology, but I think outside the U.S., it's mostly sociocultural anthropology. So I wondered how open these various journals were to publishing anything else. Uh, besides social anthropology. Um, could I, you yeah. also, Virginia, yeah. could you repeat your first part about quotation? Because I think you froze in the middle of that. Oh, I did? Citations. Okay. Citations. Um, Something you yeah, said yeah. about citations. Uh, right, I'll do a, a, a citations. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wondered if, if uh, any of the editors or the journals here actually uh, send out messages to authors as that that we don't just want things cited in their bibliographies, uh, works cited, references cited, that are uh, basically to things published in the US on the topic, the US, Australia, the UK, but in English. Uh, I know that there are uh, now a couple of uh, editors in chief of US journals that actually do that. They send out a note like that to manuscript reviewers to try to battle what appears to be a fairly common practice of oversighting uh, things published in the US. So let's leave it at that. You know that, Clara, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's something we discussed in the last webinar. Also, that you meaning yeah. you mean uh, to different... have references right. from the country where the field work is is done, right? right? References also from the 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 local anthropologists, the national anthropologists that have worked, and not only quoting uh, American or UK anthropologists, right? Yeah. I so think there, there was actually a third thing, but I can't remember now since I was trying to get <laughs> since you were frozen. I was frozen, so go ahead. I'm just curious. Yeah, Umberto, do you want to pick up this this issue since you've been in in and out and and we haven't really heard you? Where's well, Umberto? I don't know. I don't know what to. <laughs> oh, my words, but, uh, he's back. He's back. Sorry, sorry about all this this hybrid discourse. Well, I uh, basically from my what was listening now. Um, we in ethnographic actually as because. Oh, frozen again. It's gone again. It's okay. some. It's God, God does not want you to speak it's today. Not us. <laughs> okay. okay. Somebody okay. else. Who, who else wants to pick up on this issue so that I'm not any the of only these one? Diana. Diana. Yeah, any of these issues, of course. Diana. Um, yeah. To answer to the question about the limits of space, uh -huh. uh, there in the chat. I wanted to say that this is a problem for us in Publicar because the proofreader and the um, layout artist quote by page, per page. So a bigger volume is a more expensive volume for us. Mm -hmm. So we are always uh, calculating uh, according to the association we belong to, uh, how much will it it will the next volume cost, and that is a problem for us to include uh, much or many many articles. So we have to cut them sometimes and and wait for the next volume to publicate to publish those that are extra the amount we can pay for each volume. So it's not a problem uh, of space. Uh, in a physical way, but it is a problem in an economical way. Yeah, right. Who else wants to go uh, and take over this aspect that both uh, Virginia and Subatra mentioned?
Luis? Yes? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, we've never actually had a problem in terms of the uh, citation and sort of varied citation. I think because we 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 get people from. I mean, maybe more, normally this is something that the reviewers address. I think in general, but we have a. a um, I mean, in my experience, but we have so many uh, authors from so many different parts of the world that uh, uh, some, sometimes we have a sort of different problem, which is a, a lot of the works they publish. For example, a lot of works that were originally written in English are published uh, are, are quoted in Spanish or in French, and we want to get the original version so that people can access the original version. So that, that I've, I've run more into that sort of problem. Uh, when people, uh, you know, quote English speaking authors in, in a different language uh, or in a translation. Uh, in terms of the issue of size is, is an interesting one as well, because how is actually a, is published online and and then there's a hard copy as well, uh, which I think very few people get. Uh, uh, very few people actually receive the hard copy. Uh, we have a, a very generous, the, the University of, of uh, Chicago Press, who publishes how they, they give us a very generous uh, limit. I think we can, we can pub I mean, they have three issues a year and they can be huge. Uh, we, we've never used all the, the space they actually uh, give us. Um, so, so this is just, I mean, I'm not sure if it's answering the question, but we do have, we're mostly an online journal, but we do have a physical hard copy that, that is, that exists and has to be the same as the online journal. Um, yeah, and, and is distributed so that I guess there's some size limit there, but it's also very generous for some well, reason. But Luis, sorry, and Clara, you, you have the University of Chicago Press backing, right? Yes, so yes. a lot of funding. They're very generous. They have a lot of money, and it's a U.S. based thing. So. Yes. Yeah, and so so is it distributed only to the authors, the hard copy, or to to libraries? Or? No. Uh, the authors do get a copy, or, 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 and so do the editors, but there are a few subscribers who ask for the hard copy, a few libraries uh, mostly that ask for the hard copy. Um, we, we also have this, uh, when when the How is published, it's open access for a month, completely open access for a month, and the editors choose five articles um, in every issue to remain open access in perpetuity, in, in theory, for the online version. Um, okay. But yes, as Virginia says, it's a it's 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 a different reality, I think, from different beast. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, totally different, yes. Yeah, totally. So, uh, Umberto is writing. Do you want to try to talk? Take off your image, Umberto. Take off your face and just have your voice. It might not freeze that way. Well, let's see. Um, uh, well, actually, let's see if it goes right now. Oh, no, well, I was right. saying that we <laughs> publish in four languages. Normally, many uh, some of the problems you were addressed before. We don't have those problems, you know. We actually <clears throat> do not translate our articles, but to, for instance, we are now um, we will propose in in the in, in the next for the next number <clears throat> a new section that is called found in translation. That will be we will be translating an article from a let's call a marginal or a, a more inv invisible anthropology. Uh, the first article to be translated will be in this section. Lost in translation will be an article from a Moroccan uh, author, and the idea is to give space for, for instance, for Arabian anthropologists to be represented in our in our journal. <laughs> Again, a thing that can be important to, for this discussion, we are um, we are a journal uh, that is pu published with open as access. Um, we also are funded by the Portuguese government, only to give some uh, quick uh, notes and impressions from what is our uh, publishing, let's say, structure. And as I was saying before, sorry, um, we try to follow a diversity in different senses because we have an editorial board that is diverse. Also, our international advisory board is, is diverse. People from everywhere, let's say, in, in, the, in, the, in the world. People from Africa, Asia, North America, Brazil, uh, Africa, and that is our goal. And as I said, our goal is also to, to, to create um, interest to, to publish in in a Portuguese uh, journal. As you know, uh, publishing in Portugal is not the same thing as publishing in North America or in England. And, and also because Portuguese anthropology has also 
an historical relation with, with, with British anthropology, with French anthropology, with German anthropology. And so it's also a way that we can, in a certain way, we can, we can create avenues for reaching um, those mainstream, those central anthropologies in the world through ethnographica. And um, again, as I said, uh, as concerns research objects, um, geographies of writing, geographies of authorship, I think ethnographic is now doing a, a, a good job. We are, as I said before, we are now having more writers from um, all Latin America. Brazil is still, has still an hege hegemonic presence in our uh, journal. Lots of Brazilian authors, mainly new young young researchers, look at ethnographica as the first, let's say, as the first step to internationalize their, their research, because Portugal, despite as you know, despite we share, despite sharing the same language, we are actually a obviously a different country, and for many Brazilian uh, researchers, ethnographica seems to be. A journal, a journal that, in a certain way, um, um, guarantees uh, the internationalization of, of the research. In a certain way, that is good, as I said, because um, um, it's good to have different geographies. And actually, through Brazilian writings, we do have a lot of specific contexts, ethnographic contexts. We have lots of articles on very, very, very specific regions of Brazil, about different indigenous, indigenous groups. But in another way, we can, <clears throat> in a certain way, I can, that, is, that can be a problem, to be honest. In a certain way, sometimes these articles lose their connections with more general agendas in anthropology. That is good, that is bad. I cannot, I, I'm not really, uh, do not, I'm not really convinced about that because uh, if, if ethnographic, as I said, as a as the foundational proposal was to to have a representation of the world, of the entire world, and to give space for what we called also, and I wrote about that last year, to kind of uh, fight an uh, an imperial cogn an, um, uh, sorry an imperial ling uh, linguistic and cognitive approach to the world let's say, through English language. And despite our, our policy was to give space for, for different languages, for different approaches, I think sometimes this loss of reference with other major um, debates and other major narratives in anthropology can be a problem, not, not for, the, <clears throat> not for the, those who write, not for those who are represented, but perhaps for to those, if we want to expand our readership and our um, reception, that can be a problem for us. And I, I stop here because I'm not, you are not seeing my face and I not want no, to okay. monopolize. We saw, your, we saw your face before, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> we saw it before, it's not a problem. But it's okay, it's don't worry. Problem. But it's nice to hear okay. you. Okay, so this was one issue also here being discussed in the chat, which is the fact that uh, sometimes uh, journals prefer shorter articles because referees prefer to read shorter articles and referees are normally pro bono. I don't know of any journal that pays for uh, peer reviewing. Sometimes books pay something, or at least they gave you some okay. some some books free, but well, as for journals, journals normally they don't, right, Virginia? That's correct. Yeah. So that's that's the same everywhere, uh, and uh, yeah, and and peer reviewing, as we know, is a is a complicated uh, strategy. I mean, it, it works, but to a certain extent only, because sometimes Sarah, you do I, get. I, I do have something else I want to bring up, but Gordon has set his hand up for a while, so I will okay. yield. Gordon, Gordon. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, first of all, book publishers do indeed give quite a bit. $300 worth of books or whatever. I mean, if I get uh, 20 books for reviewing a book for a press, that's you know quite a reward. Journals do not. So that's a significant difference. Now, back to the earlier issue that Luis and others of you brought up in terms of size. Um, it's not necessarily the case that bigger is better, because I think, Luis, if you get 300 research articles a year, 
uh, and you can only accept, I mean, I don't know, I know you're open access, but, but if you can only accept 50 a year, you probably reject a lot of really good stuff. Um, when I was a journal editor for Asian Anthropology, I wanted to have 60 submissions a year because that gave, if I could accept 20, that meant that I could properly hit a sweet spot where I wouldn't reject things that, that I didn't want to reject, but I'd have to go over them. On the other hand, I know a lot of journal editors really suffer, and it's largely because of these global inequalities. And I remember speaking to a European editor who said, if only I had access to American ethnologist garbage pail. <laughs> Now, I know, Luis, you gave a good answer in here saying that you uh, do indeed recommend other journals. But what I think we'd like in a global sense, if we could, is where you've got people submitting to journals around the world instead of only the, I don't want to go, want to go into hegemony, but the hegemonic uh, leading journals of the world. So that, you know, Korean Journal of Cultural Anthropology or Ethnography or whatever could get uh, submissions from all over the world. And particularly in the global north, this would be accepted as a valid publication. I don't I don't think we see this yet, though. I think if, if, for example, a young scholar were to publish in a Portuguese journal or a Korean journal, if that scholar is in America, they might not get get recognition for that at all. And hopefully, we can overcome this in time to come. I don't know how to do it, but well, that that is the key issue. Yeah, and that's yeah, Virginia, not... you had your hand yeah. up. Sorry, uh, that's not necessarily. This is uh, too gorgeous, point. Uh, that is not necessarily. Uh, just because uh, anthropologists in the U.S. ignore the rest of the world, though they do, um, but uh, you know the rest of the world often really still annoyingly to me privileges publications in U.S. journals. So you know it, both are true. But what I wanted to bring up, I thought Gordon would, but but I I will say this probably less diplomatically than some of you would, but uh, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think Ethnographica, for example, is great and is probably a leader in publishing in several languages, but I think they are still all European languages. Um, wouldn't it be great if, in fact, that were not the case? I mean, Russian, even Chinese, Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Korean, absolutely, yes. Right. So, so if I may briefly, that, I think that that's something that we've actually tried to do at How, and one of the problems we have with some languages are reviewers. We have a very limited pool of reviewers in some languages, uh, and some themes. Uh, uh, it, it 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 kind of becomes. Uh, I mean, even for French and Portuguese. I mean, I know because I'm a Brazilian anthropologist, and I've got, I receive a lot of. Uh, I mean, I don't know if Umberto feels the same way in terms of etnographica, but. Uh, I keep going to the same reviewers for people that I know are, are, are used to reviewing articles and, and I don't know, I don't, maybe that's my problem specific and not a general problem. I think there are people who claim that, Luis. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are a zillion Spanish-speaking anthropologists from Latin American countries and from Spain who can read Portuguese. They might not feel they can speak it, but they can. It's a yeah. very long time. But but I think if if I if I may may I raise my hand I think I think one of the problems here is what I think Gordon was saying and we've discussed this also in the last webinar it's not just the journals I mean I feel that nowadays the journals a lot of journals as we've been seeing today are willing to publish in several languages so it's getting better from the hegemonic situation of English that was you know like ten years ago the problem is the academic careers. We are academics. People publish in journals because they need to publish in journals to have their careers, okay? And the problem is if the institutions themselves, like here in Portugal, uh, you know, grade your CV much higher because you published in known American journals as American anthropologist, as uh, how, etc. you know, th there's no way around because people, the academics, prefer to publish in those because they need to have the points for their career. There's even a, you know, there's even a numbers for you get X if you publish in the top journals, you get much less if you publish in the other ones. And that's what makes it also uneven because it, it's a sort of a, a round circle where we don't get out of because, um, because journals will not raise their qualities if good papers are not published there and academics don't want to publish there because they prefer to prefer in the high rated ones. I'm not even talking about, I mean, for instance, Ethnographica is, is classified in Scopus and everything, but, you know, if you publish something in American Anthropologist, 
then you have it, right? So yeah. that has and that's very and that's very annoying, Clara. It's very annoying. I can tell you because I come from Portugal, so I can tell you it's very annoying. Trust but me. it has I not am changed. In the, I am in the U.S., but it's still very annoying to me. It's very annoying. It has not changed, and I sincerely do not know how we are going to change this. Well, I think one way we could do this is uh, we could have many more. Um, let's see. People who don't worry about their careers uh, at whatever. <laughs> but we need we need to pay our we need to pay our mortgages. We all worry about our that careers. Is not the question is the rich anthropologist who don't need a very a good right. salaries. What is it? <laughs> well, Does it exist in Virginia? Yeah, people. <laughs> yes, actually, uh, among other things, there are people in various countries who are at the highest level of whatever they do, and uh, okay. Uh, and, you know, even if they just published in one journal every other year, a journal that is not considered, you know, really fancy or distinguished, that, that, that could start a trend. But it would be it would be up to individuals to begin to do this. I mean, I don't yeah. know. Lisa had her hand up. Hi. Yeah, thank you. I, this isn't like a fully formed thought, but I'm thinking about how in the U.S. right now there's this huge move at the university level to uh, focus on career readiness. And that one of the things that I think I'll work on from the US end, because practicing anthropology, we do like to publish work by practitioners and people in the field. So it's not, it's not highly rated in terms of an academic journal, but it's a place where people can do kind of dispatches and reports from the field and they're shorter. Wow. Um, and I like the idea of using the focus on career readiness to say career readiness means being able to practice what you do globally. And that maybe in this way, people can make arguments for their tenure portfolios and things that will push journals that are not the American anthropologists, which I also find very annoying um, from the US, uh, but also raise the status of other journals that publish practice, that publish globally, that show a global reach. So I think there's like a little bit of an opportunity to market um, that to tenure review committees and for people who are in the U.S., but also elsewhere to show that that global piece and the ability to practice globally is also is um, just as important, if not more important for uh, students and people who are going up for tenure. Helen, did you see Helen's hand? Yeah, I was, I was saying, Helen, you have your hand up? Hi everyone. Helen, um, oh, we were thinking before that you are a boom zomber. A, 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 a <laughs> <zoom. laughs> I, I don't think Michelle wrote to me. I'm zoom. keeping an eye on Alan. He Helen. wrote, I'm keeping a zoom an bomb, eye on a Helen. Zoom bomber, a zoom bomber is not going to call themselves Helen, but anyway. <laughs> Um, one of the comments I one of the comments I wanted to make was you know, here in South Africa, certainly at UCT, there is, it's not so much about which journal you publish in because we've got, as long as they're peer reviewed and they uh, they come on a particular government list that, that is accepted, then that's not going to affect your, your promotion. What affects your promotion is this notion of building an international network of citations. So I've made a real point of, I publish one local, publish two international. And the reason I try to publish locally is because I wanna really help our local journal an African journal. But you know, when I went for promotion, went into my citations, it's not the local journal where I'm getting cited. Absolutely. So it's 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 where you publish that leads to a greater number of citations and mm. not necessarily the journal you publish in that sits on my CV and gets counted as a, as a journal per se, but it affects the citations of people who are citing me. And... You know, I had to point out to my promotion committee, they, they asked me to write like an overview and I was quite lucky that I was invited to do this where I was able to state 
that my political, my, my kind of political stance on publishing is that I have to at least publish something locally. It's an imperative for, you know, a post-colonial, decolonial anthropology. Yet the, the trade-off is those publications are very, very rarely cited. Um, and what, what can we do about that? You know, it's imperative we publish locally, but what if they're just not getting cited? Yep. Yeah, that's that's another problem. So of course we've come up with a lot of problems, not a lot of solutions. <laughs> that's well, the, some solutions. But, uh, and yeah, that in, in in answer to Helen, I think this online publishing, you know, journals going online, and certain you know portals like Academic Edu and things like that that draw in a lot of articles from different parts of the world. The citation, uh, I mean, levels are increasing because nowadays when people Google search, they can uh, access articles that are published, you know, in different parts of the world. And then those articles have a, you know, chance of getting cite, uh, you know, getting a citation. So I think more into online publishing and having uh, these portals which uh, bring out, you know, to draw in uh, these articles uh, is a help. Uh, it, it, it could uh, lead to more, you know, uniform, you know, at least a, a horizontal spread of, of the you know, possibility of getting cited even if you are not published in a very late year. Totally, totally agree, Subhadra. And one of the things I've had to do is use social media to more actively promote my papers uh, as well. But equally, I'm not the kind of person who likes to do self-promotion. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be, you know, it's a catch-22 in many ways. But I yeah. agree that online publishing and Google Scholar have opened up a variety of more local scholarship in ways that we never used to have. But Isaac has his hand up. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I just want to echo what Subhadra and Helen have said about, uh, you know, local journals and particularly uh, the print journals, because uh, often those don't go beyond you know, the institutions where they are published. But when it comes to online publishing, I think that opens up a whole new world of, you know, uh, possibilities. And particularly if you have a mix of uh, publishing in local journals that are online, but also on the more known journals out there, because then, people start getting to recognize the name and they, they would tend to look for the name online. They will look for Helen. They will look for Isaac online. But if the papers that have been published locally are also online, then you have a chance of pulling those uh, as well. And then, you know, the, you know, people out there are able then to see uh, not just what is published, you know, in the other well-known journals, but also what is published locally. So yes, I think uh, online has given us new possibilities. I, I just wanted to echo what Helena said and Subhadra. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Well, you know, uh, we've been here two hours. Of course, we were very interrupted by boom zoomers. No, zoom. it's not boom zoomers, it's zoom bombers. Zoom bombers. Sorry. <laughs> the other way around. The, the zoom bombers are even making me dyslexic. It's just crazy. So, um, <laughs> I think we should come to an end. I think a lot of important questions have been raised, some solutions, not solutions for everything, of course. But I, I'm just imagining if in two years' time, Zoom still exists and if we're all still here and we make a new Global Editors uh, webinar, perhaps things have changed. Perhaps we'll be able to say, well, you know, two years ago or three years ago, we were saying this and that. And fortunately, things have changed. Let's hope it works. And um and people have more opportunity to publish even in smaller journals and still be recognized for that. Laura, so I look, to, I want to Laura, test. One quick thing before we go. Somebody, I'm not sure, I think it was Sumahan, 
uh, who said earlier that we should create a network. I think that would be great. Or you could start simply with the email uh, addresses that you use, Clara, to put yeah. these. Or I can, the, the people, Emily is here. And Thank the, you very WCA, much, Madam. The, the WCA Publishing Council has all the mails of all these people because I've always CC them. So, so if the WCA Publishing Council wants to get this going, that would be a very interesting, even a task force for WCA or something, no? Yeah, yeah, but, but Deja uh, Lu yes, also uh, yes, has not on that journal list. published. So don't just use the publishing task force. There are probably 50 or more journals that could all be on this list. So yeah, great. That would be a good idea. That would be a good idea, but it would yes. be an immense Like, for instance, Lisa mm. here is saying uh, she's not on the list. Of course not. Because... We can add her now that we have her name. We can add her. Yeah, okay. Yes. Because could, could we also... Could we, uh, I, could I really we also... Like... Sorry. Go ahead, Isaac. Yes, could we also perhaps also encourage anthropologists, especially for papers that can be shared freely, uh, that are published, that we can have them on the you know WCA website. That would be a uh, good well, we, place. Well, I I don't know Isaac because we have Deja Lu, so we already have something that publishes yes. that. Yes, Deja Lu, you know, that is for, you know, and we have to seek uh, certain permissions we have to write, but if there are papers that can be freely, you know, shared, um, and particularly papers where the authors retain the, the copyright, those can be put on the website once they are published. Mm, okay, we have to see that somebody, you know, we'd have to find people who are willing to do this because it's not we have to, to check that. That's an idea. We'll, we'll have to see um, how we want to go about this. But well, anyway, I want to thank everyone and apologize for the Zoom bombers, although it's nobody's fault. At least we had some fun, but it was a very troubled webinar as we never had before. I mean, people were being Zoom, people were frozen, people were disappear. So, well, this was a different webinar, but still very pleasant. And thank you very, very much to our participants and to everyone who is here today with us. And uh, we will edit the webinar so that it goes on the site without the more, the less pleasant um, images. Okay. Thank you very much and see you next time. So the next webinar will be uh, actually in uh, Gordon is in charge with this task force on uh, glow. What's it called? W Gordon again, the the task force. Sorry, I, I've been my my brain has been zoomed. Making anthropology what? global with yeah, yes, yeah. making anthropology global. I say I was going to say global anthropology, but of course the it's already global editor. So the next webinar in September will be on making anthropology global. See you all again. Thank you very much to everyone. Bye. Bye.